Um, let me start this presentation with a comparison of uh, a couple of visualization models. If I were to ask you, what is this? What would you think it is? It's a plant set. That's all it is. Now, let me switch this to this. It is remarkable, right? So that's, exact, that's actually what is happening right now. There is a transformation. You could call it a revolution in the way transportation projects, not just transportation projects, mind you, but in general, horizontal projects or civil infrastructure projects are designed and built. Now, what's important about this is not so much the visualization, although the visualization is a very important component, because from here you can very easily tell you know, all the features, etc. But it's also the ability to associate attribute data to those features. So if you have a database behind it, you can, for instance, have this facility, and I don't really know what it is, but you could, for example, have an attribute value associated with this, assuming this is the same owner, for example, but you could have different diameters, you could have different attributes that could be associated with that. The trick is to have a database behind the feature class, or whatever it is that you are trying to model. So, Again, this is the current practice in many, uh, for many projects, and, and I don't have to remind you that what we have is what? A collection of plan views, profiles, cross sections, but the transformation that we are seeing is this. So instead of having disconnected plan views, cross sections, and profiles, what we have is objects, right? And there are many different ways to do this. You could have stick figures, and they are still 3D models. You could have a, a decent rendering in this case, and you could actually go all the way to have very fancy renderings, very complicated, very expensive, by the way. But uh, what's important is that this is what's happening. Don mentioned <clears throat> in the case of uh, uh, Texas that uh, there are two types of, or actually three, I just forgot to mention the other ones, but I, let me just mention two, uh, concession development agreements and design build projects. And you mentioned risk. In the case of utilities, how are utilities ma managed with these two models of the comprehensive development agreements? In the case of concession development agreements, for the most part, the developer is responsible for the, all the utility investigations. In the case of design and build projects, it's different because Texas is, is, is trying to recoup the investment right away, and of course, Texas wants to minimize the risk, and as a result, Texas conducts some of the utility investigations ahead of time. Why? Because of the interest in reducing the risk. Now, what's interesting here is there is this contract provision that was added to the contracts uh, a couple of years ago, maybe. And notice the requirements. One of the requirements is to develop a 3D model of the existing surface and underground features, you know, drainage, bridge, and wall foundations, and utilities. That's the first requirement. The second requirement is to develop a 3D model of design features for existing and proposed elements of work, including all of these. And the third one is the requirement to use software that enables interactive 3D visualizations for project discussions and so on and so forth, right? Now, that's the design-build world. What about the design-build-build? Well, it looks like some of the lessons learned from the design-build process, not just in Texas, but from around the country, are actually forcing uh, agencies to change the way they actually develop projects even for design-build-build. And so there is an initiative to <coughs> have a transition from 2D to, from 2D to 3D. And as far as I know, the, the, the activity or the plan called for writing a business case, uh, developing plan for, uh, plans for training on how to build 3D models internally. And notice here the focus is on basic functionality, no, nothing fancy rendering because that's very expensive. Uh, the focus right now seems to be on surface and drainage features. Utilities are not included, but the plan is to have utilities included in, in, the, in the 3D model depiction. Now, the real question is, when you do utility investigations, most of the current practice enables the department and agencies to collect 2D information about utilities. So how do you incorporate 2D information about utilities in a 3D model? So if you don't have information about the Z, the solution would be to have broken lines shown on the surface if the C data is not available. Is that ideal? I would ask you, and the answer would be no, <laughs> right? So clearly we need to do something. Um, FHWA uh, 
conducted a research project, and we were very fortunate in, in, in being selected for that. We completed the research project earlier in the year, and this is what FHWA wanted to do, because Texas is not alone. There are many states that are actually exploring options on how to move to the 3D world. They wanted to know how ready state DOTs were, and look at some of the issues. You know, what are the benefits of having accurate utility information? What are the risks? What are the strategies? Uh, FSWA was also very much interested in, in examining the use of RFID uh, marking technology, uh, drawing on the lessons learned from uh, the experience in, in Virginia. Uh, I'm not going not to talk about the RFID because of lack of time, but I will certainly talk about some of the other issues. So, the current practice for utility investigations calls for collecting X and Y data. How many of you are familiar with ASC 3802? Can you raise your hand? All right, it seems like it's a minority. We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> uh, so essentially this standard, which is a consensus standard, uh, describes the process to collect information about underground utility installations. And to do that, the standard describes four different levels, beginning with a review of existing records, and if it is signed and sealed, then there is a possibility to assign a quarter level, in this case D, to that information. Uh, quarter level C would be based on what you see with the naked eye. You survey the installations and then you correlate that with the underground utility information and then you assign quarter level C to those installations. Then later in, in, in the process you would do geophysical uh, investigations and you would enable to have quarter level B. And finally, if you have test holes or other means to expose utilities, you would be able to have quarter level A. So I'm not going to go too much into that, only to say that the current practice usually involves the collection of X and Ys. And even though the technology for geophysical investigations is improving all the time, the standard unfortunately only allows uh, consultants to provide or certify information in X and Ys. Existing you now DOTs in are increasingly interested in the Z information. And so one of the recommendations always is, well, try to give them a little bit of wiggle room and, yes, ask the consultants to provide information certified and sign a quality level B, but whatever information is available, ask them to give that to you. You know, there is an element of risk that you have to manage, but that's a different story. Well, of course, you have the quality level A data, you know, which is something that you need to have. The problem is that even if you have quarter level A data, it is only at certain points. You have a test hole, you may have a valve, you may have another test hole and manholes. The question is, how do you interpolate between those points, right? You could do this, you could do this, even this. And I would argue that unless you are a subject matter expert, you don't really have any idea, right? And so, one of the things that the industry has been trying to do over the years, in recent years, is to come up with you know, more sophisticated equipment. In this case, uh, GPR array and EMI arrays, electromagnetic induction, in this case. And the result is usually this, is 3D imagery. But that's not very useful, right? What you would like to do is what? Convert this into something that you can actually make use of you know, 3D models. But in this case, notice, and I don't really know the genesis of this particular image in this case, but I do know that the goal is to be able to provide a Z component, which is what you actually need for design, right? So, <clears throat> that was sort of the first part of the study. The second part involved going around the country and try to find out what people were doing. And we actually uh, conducted surveys, and then we also interviewed people, traveled several locations, and we found some very interesting lessons learned. In the interest of time, let me just focus on three right here. And the good news, we submitted the report, it's under publication, and uh, if you're interested in the, in the draft report, I can get FSWA to allow us to send you an email if you're interested in it, so let me know. But let me just touch base on three of those, all right? In California, it had nothing to do with the road, but it was interesting for another reason. In this case, it was the Port of Los Angeles, and it was a berth that it was still under operation, so the design phase didn't allow the contractor to do a, a the designer to do a thorough utility investigation. So it was, of course, ready for construction, and then during construction, the, the contractor then had to do a thorough utility investigation. So here is more or less what it looked like, you know, during construction, and this is what it looked like even before construction. So it's, it was impossible to do a utility investigation. 
the contractor then decided to build a 3D model. And some people may be asking, okay, but it must be very difficult to build a 3D model. Uh, this was a young engineer who had no previous experience doing any kind of 3D modeling design or anything. Within a couple of weeks, this designer was able to build a 3D model and start to ident identify utility conflicts. So keep that in mind because the process is actually not that complicated. The software is becoming more user friendly, that's the good news. And so once the 3D model was built, but because of all the design features had already been determined in design, the contractor was able to identify a few locations where there were obvious utility conflicts. You see some of those here. And so, you know, of course, they went through the, ba the usual process during construction to address these conflicts, but there were some interesting lessons learned. So, <clears throat> one of the lessons learned, and in this case it's obvious, is about the importance of quality information before going to construction. That was, of course, lesson number one. Uh, as far as the designer was concerned, focus on the basics. You know, leave the rendering for later. Definitely, the contractor was so happy with this, they decided we're going to use this for all future projects. Now, in this case, they were already using 3D for automated machine guidance, which helped, but they didn't have the utilities, and they would like to include utilities in all future projects. And I will touch base on that, I'll touch base on that a little bit later. Now, here's the last one, which is very important. I asked that contractor what, you know, if they prefer to handle utility conflicts during the construction phase. And guess the answer? Nope. Because there's no money in, in, in addressing utility conflicts during construction. You know, they would prefer for that process to be handled during design. And I think that is perhaps an important lesson because we talk about, you know, the design process and all that, but we forget construction. Once we talk to a contractor, then we realize they don't want to deal with utility conflicts during construction. It's not cost effective for anyone. So that was an important lesson. The second lesson came from Textile. Uh, we were interested in, trying, in finding out a project where 3D design was being done, and it so happened that the Grand Parkway project in Houston is being designed, at least these sections are being designed in 3D. And so we were interested in finding out what was the process to handle utility investigation. And so this is how the, the, the utility coordinator uh, did it. So first of all, they had some previous quality level B data. They analyzed the data. Keep in mind that there was a main developer and the 3D modeler for the developer was very much interested in developing a 3D model right away. So the, mo the modeler asked for all the information and said, okay, I'm going to build a 3D model. But remember what I said earlier, if you don't have good quality data to start with, you're not going to be able to have a quality 3D model for utilities. So the utility coordinator insisted, no, we need to collect additional information. And that was a wise decision. You know, because after all, also, there are this, these are multi-year projects, and so you could also have additional utilities on the ground. They also did this, strengthen the utility permitting process. One of the things that you have, and most of you perhaps are familiar with the UIR system, but you also know that even before that, the process to submit and, re and, and review permit, uh, utility permits is a very casual process in the sense that there is not an engineering signature or seal associated with that. There is none. But what they did was to ask utility companies to submit documentation signed and sealed by a PE. In addition to that, they strengthened that with field inspections and survey. So that increased the quality of the information resulting from the utility permitting process, which in turn helped them improve the quality of the information before building the 3D model for utilities. So they went ahead and then built the 3D model for utilities, incorporated that into the main project model, and then they were able to do what is called hard and soft uh, clash detections. Right? The last thing they did was uh, they used the last one here, UCM, the Utility Conflict Management Approach that was developed as part of a separate strategic highway research project, R15B. And we're not gonna talk about that today. I think Edgar, perhaps you're, you'll talk about that later, right? Okay, so that was the other thing they did. So they incorporated the data and then they applied it to the conflict management practices. The third example is from Washington. Uh, this one is about the, another mega project, uh, another mega project, this is in Seattle. And it was very interesting to see that even though these were very different projects, different communities, different engineers, they didn't talk to each other, and yet they came up with different, I'm sorry, with similar techniques to maintain the utility information current. So one of the things they did was, okay, calculate spot utility elevations, but they didn't limit themselves to um, test holes. 
they actually went to buildings and basements and you know all kinds of other uh, similar installations to try to come up with a reasonable source of 3D information. In the case of uh, uh, Seattle, they also did like what uh, was done in the Grand Parkway project. Uh, they used subject matter experts to try to estimate depths between spot locations and they developed the 3D model. They collected core level A at critical locations and they updated the 3D model as needed. This was interesting because remember, this is a multi-year project. So how do you maintain the information up to date? And this is what they did. They developed a program whereby every you know, three, six months or so, they would review all the city construction projects, I'm sorry, permits, realizing as part of this process that not every utility installation require a permit. So that's something you need to be, you bear in mind. They also reviewed all one call tickets with all the limitations it has. And then they did a number of things, including walking the project and scanning for evidence of new, new, new utility information. In the case of Seattle, this was critical because there were you know, CCTV cameras that had been installed, new <coughs> utility installations that had been added to the network, and yet there was not an official record for that. So, so that was the second part we did. The third part, and this one was the toughest one, uh, FSWA was interested in determining return on investment. And this one was very difficult because there was no hard data. And so all really we could do was to, okay, what is the cost to develop a 3D model for a typical project? And the more we talked to people, we interviewed several states, Iowa, Wisconsin, a bunch of other states that have been using 3D modeling uh, for, a no, for a long time. And the overall conclusion was that the impact on the project cost is minor. So we started out with that. So what are the benefits of doing 3D modeling? That was the other thing that, for which there was no data. But we got some pieces, you know, including some data from Norway where they had been using 3D for uh, design and construction where they found 75 fewer change orders. And one of the reasons for this is that they have the ability to better visualize the project. And when you have that ability, you are able to identify conflicts better and you are able to identify problems that you can then, uh, you, you can then use to your advantage. The result is fewer change orders. In terms of cost savings, this was a difficult one to measure. And it was anywhere from 4 to 15%. So, now, what about utilities? Everybody likes to use, um, everybody likes to collect good utility data, no one wants to pay for it. <laughs> Not the case. Uh, we came up with some numbers based on what we found in the literature. Uh, you know, going back a couple decades to a study that was done in Purdue, uh, there was another study done in Pennsylvania, there was another one done in Canada and a, few, a couple other places. And they all point to something between 0.2 and 3% of the total project cost. Still the question is, is that a lot of money? Maybe, maybe it is. The question is, can you justify that investment? And well, once you start to see some of the benefits, is that when you do qual level B and qual level A, qual level B for the whole project and qual level A for certain locations, you can identify most of the existing utility installations that are suspected to exist in the area, uh, and you can have project cost savings of about 4% of the total project cost. So, if you are willing to spend anywhere between 0.2 and 3% of the total project, and the expected benefits are roughly about 4%, you have a positive return on investment. I'm not, unfortunately, we don't have any harder data than that, but it's just to suggest that. Now, the question is, if you use 3D, then what kind of benefits you should be able to get? Well, I mentioned earlier that the cost to develop 3D models is not that huge. At least the agencies that we interviewed all basically said, you know, the cost is relatively minor, meaning that the cost really is about the cost to collect good quality data. That's about it. So if you factor this in, then that means that you should expect to have a significant benefit when you're doing 3D you could perhaps expect to get up to 4% of the project, co project total cost in terms of cost savings if you use 3D modeling for utilities. At the end, we came up with a number of implementation goals, and I'm not gonna go through that in detail, only to say that we wrote a, a, a fairly robust implementation plan, and what we really hope is that FHWA will take it to the next level. So we divided this into four goals, meaning strategies that are readily implementable. 
Some of them are obvious, you know, <laughs> use utility data models if you have one, strengthen utility permitting requirements, uh, disseminate the results of the research, of course. But notice here this one, which is, I think, perhaps one that's important, is use standard-based utility data collection and reporting protocols. This is an area in which every DOT that I've spoken to can certainly improve things. Um, FSWA and ASHTO, and Textor is actually participating in one of the implementation projects, is actually trying to do something about this. And we're really happy, you know, that this is happening, so. Uh, then, of course, there are other areas in which more work is, is, is needed, including one to identify risk levels. And Don mentioned about risk management. But one of the things that doesn't currently exist is you have, it doesn't really matter how you collect the data, you still don't have a good way to identify the amount of risk you have, you know, because at, at the end of the day, it's, inform it's information about installations that you cannot see. And that's something that we as a community need to do some work on. And I think that's it. Excellent. Thanks, Don. Any Thank questions? You.